Hello, and welcome to Science Faction, a weekly science program here on your community channel. In the high-tech special effects world in which we live in today, it's not always easy to separate fact from fiction. This program attempts to make better our understanding of what is real and what is not in the world of science. At the same time, we look to the future. Science is progressive and ever-changing. What is not real, does not exist today, may very well be here tomorrow. Other subjects covered on this program are nature and human interest stories. My name is Hank Gray, and now, here's your host, John Winston. Hello, I'm John Winston, and today we're going to be showing you something about the ocean and the bay, and we've got Karen Grimmer with us today, and she's from the Marine Science Institute. But before we go in that, I've got to tell you about something important. I learned how to catch fish off of the Santa Cruz Pier. Well, I consider this to be the greatest accomplishment in uh, the last 30 minutes. Actually, you go out there and you see about 75 people up and down this pier just fishing like nobody's business and they may catch just a few fish. My policy is I go where the Asians are, the Filipinos, the Vietnamese and other things, and I sit out there and ask them what they're doing. I found out what they're using for bait, like grass shrimp, and then I act exactly like them. Well, after I did that, I caught a little bitty fish about that long. Then I went over to the place where they have all these sea lions arcing and barking and cavorting all around, you know? And uh, I saw another person fishing there, and he was catching them like nobody's business. So ultimately, I caught 23 goggle-eyed perch. And maybe one of these days, I'll tell you how it's done. Now we're going to go into our famous computer man. We'll be back in just a minute. In 1984, this man took a bite out of a floppy disk, chewed it up, and swallowed. Unbeknownst to him, that floppy disk was infected by a computer virus, and so he became a computer man. <laughs> oh, hey, welcome to the home office. Just watching these deficit figures pile up. They keep growing and growing. If only there was some way I could reduce the... Wait a minute. House party, of course. It's a scientifically documented fact. The power of music to... You know this stuff. Look, maybe if we all rap together, we can make this deficit go away. Come on, let's try it. What's this? No, deficit, no. Hey, it's going down. And dancing helps too. Come on, let's try it, everybody. No, deficit, no. To the beat. No, deficit, no. Try it in Japanese. Akaji nakanak day. It really works. Well, that's it from the home office. I'm Computer Man solving the Treasury Department's problems with a personal computer. <laughs> oh, yeah, what about the time? As I told you before, I'm going to have on Karen Grimmer now, and she's from the Marine Science Institute. Now, it's too bad that we couldn't find a good-looking young lady to come on, but we decided we'd bring on this lady anyway. 
I'm sure that whenever <laughs> you see her, you'll know what I'm talking about. Thank you. Okay, Karen, uh, would you tell us a little bit about your job and what you do? Yes, um, I'm the Director of Education at Marine Science Institute. And um, what I basically do is oversee all the programs that we have and hire and train all the instructors. So it's a kind of a varied job, do a lot of different things. Okay, where is this place located anyway? Okay, it's in Marine Science Institute, it's in Redwood City, it's by the port there. And we have um, a beach area with a ship and a uh, number of different programs going on there. It's a marine education organization. Oh, I see. How many people work there? Well, we have about four, four full-time people and about 12 part-time people, marine science instructors. Hmm. Do a lot of people volunteer? come down there and help you out? Yes, we do have quite a few volunteers and we have a docent program going on. A so what anyone program? A, a docent program. It's something... Oh, well that's whenever you take people around and act like a guide? Is that yes, what you do? Yes, they actually um, are trained, to, they go through a training period and learn how to teach marine science to all ages. Okay, we're going to be showing the people the ship that you go out on. Mm -hmm. Explain to me how big it is and is there are there more than one boat that you go out on ship? Well, we have one boat right now. It's an 85-foot research vessel, and mm. um, it takes about 40 people at a time on a boat, on the boat. Um, we go in between the, the uh, Dumbarton Bridge and the San Mateo Bridge, so mainly stay in the South Bay, and um, we bring non-school groups as well as school groups out there. How are you funded? Uh, does it cost, uh, they put a 50 cents into a turnstile and come in? Oh, I wish it was that easy. Um, I guess about half of our funding is from uh, schools and the other half comes from uh, local foundations and corporations. They donate a sponsorship. So if a school pays um, a chunk of the voyage, a lot of these foundations and corporations pick up the extra cost for it. What did you do to qualify you for a job like this? Well, I started working from the bottom, which was at on the boat as a marine science instructor about four years ago, and worked three days a week for about a year, and then started doing some program development. Um, I have a degree in, in uh, zoology, actually, which is a little different, but it's a science background, which is mainly what we're looking for. Um, and then I have an emphasis in marine biology. Where did you go to school, anyway? San Francisco State, so local. San Francisco State. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Well, that sounds interesting. Now, what type of monster did you bring along? From well, this? I brought a is representative a of the bay. This is one of the sharks that we see a lot of. And let's see if he's feeling like cooperating right now. And we'll, this is this is called hands-on education. As mm -hmm. you can see, I'm looking at him hands-on. And this is what we do with the kids. We basically show them a live animal, let them touch it, and um, look at it, and explore all about it. Now, I won't have hold him out too long. I can put him back in for a second so that he gets some water. But it's a beautiful leopard shark, as you can see. You're welcome to touch it if you'd like. Yeah. There you go. Kind and of a leathery, sort of a feeling there. Yes, he is. He's got denticles, which are layered um, scales. I've caught a leopard shark like that off of the San Mateo, or the Dumbarton Bridge uh -huh. out there. They're about that size. They are. They, they get up to about seven feet, but this one's a juvenile still. Yeah? Yeah. We see a lot of small ones in the bay. I've had a lot of the experiences that would probably make you uh, squirm around, but I, I've killed a lot of things like this. I don't mm -hmm. kill things anymore. Mm -hmm. I once went fishing in the ocean and I caught a blue shark about that long. Really? And then uh, later on I, I went out and uh, I caught another shark that long mm -hmm. and a, a shark got underneath the boat. My wife was with me and she said, well honey, le that looks like his daddy. And the shark was as long as the boat is, 14 really? foot long, and he That's started a big one. started scooting up against the bottom of the boat. And I picked up a deer rifle and shot down into the water, and I got out of the area. Oh! My, my wife didn't know that I was rather excited. Okay. <laughs> well, we definitely don't kill sharks at Marine Science Institute. That's In good. fact, we teach um, environmental awareness. So we basically teach um, kids how they fit into the environment, what they can do to protect it, and take care of the animals. Hopefully. 
How clean is the bay now? Well, is it getting cleaner or is it getting dirtier? It's getting cleaner, a lot cleaner than 20 years ago when we were putting raw sewage into it. Mm -hmm. So now um, the corporations are a lot better with the toxins that they're putting into the bay, or trying to be at least, and the sewage treatment is a lot better. So we're seeing health, a healthy um, animal stock in there. Do you know anything about the oyster producing areas in the bay? Do you ever There's heard no about more that? oyster producing areas, not at all. There are no more? No more. Um, those were wiped out because of the sewage and previously because of pollution. So now we have a lot of oyster shells but no oysters. There are, however, some other clams that are infiltrating from Asia and from other areas that are now taking over a lot of the bay bottom, the mud that's in the bottom, the benthos. Mm. And do they have any, this is just what you got through saying, but I sometimes fish for catfish and mm -hmm. they use clams. Where would they get those kind of clams? Clams you can get anywhere. Um, we have a mud grab at the Institute. We just put right down off the pier and we bring up the mud sample and you rinse the mud sample through a screen and there's lots of clams in there. Japanese lolnecks, Asian clams. Hmm. Um, so they're easy to get and easy to find. Do you know anything about the migration of the striped bass or anything like that? Well, I know that there's less of them now because of the water diversion um, from the delta. There's not as much fresh water coming into the bay. It's being diverted Is south. Is that desirable? Um, not for the animals in the bay, no. They need a certain amount of fresh water. And striped bass is one of the ones that is becoming endangered now. We are actually seeing some, though, in the, in the South Bay lately. We've seen some small ones, which is a good sign. Do striped bass like salt water or fresh water? Well, they like um, estuary water, which is a mixture of fresh and salt water. Really? Yeah, and that when they're young, that when they're juveniles, and then as they get older, they migrate out into the ocean. And it's pretty interesting. Yes, I noticed that uh, you can catch big old striped bass right out in the ocean mm -hmm. down at uh, San Martin's Beach. I've mm -hmm. been fishing down there for smelt with uh, the throw nets and everything, you mm -hmm. know, and the, the seines, and we'd bring them mm -hmm. up and catch 30 or 40 of them. And the big striped bass that long would be going right through those smelt, right. biting them, they eat is those. Eating, eating them, mm -hmm. and there would be some fishermen catching those there at mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah, that's a good place to catch big, big striped bass, yeah. definitely. And the idea of those things coming into the bay is uh, really something. Yeah, it is. Um, the bay is such a special place because it is an estuary and it creates kind of a buffer zone for young animals. And it's shallow, it's protected from predators, and um, so it's a really good place for juvenile fish. Okay, now we're going to go into some information that we got from the discovery that they take out. Okay. So we want you to Explain to us what happens whenever they go out on this discoverer. Okay, well, we'll take the audience along on the voyage. Um, here we are starting at Marine Science Institute. This is our outreach um, aquarium we bring out to schools called the Marine Science Mobile. And um, we are one of the only facilities in the peninsula or in the Bay Area that brings live fish and animals out to schools. And here's our offices. Who started this organization? The president and founder is Bob Rutherford, and he founded this organization 23 years ago. And it's um, been oper in operation all that time? It's been in operation all the time. Now this is our Discovery Voyage boat at the Inland Seas, and this boat is 50 years old this year, and it's been going for the last 23 years, six days a week, twice a day, eight to 12, and one to five. So it's been a, a yeah. really a workhorse for us. If you'll notice real close, I think I saw a hole in this thing. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> in, the, in the very top of it. Oh. I'll try to point that Maybe out. Maybe in the top. See it. Now here we have a school class going on board. They look like about fifth or sixth graders. And they're going into the cabin for a little introductory talk and to be told about the safety rules. We have a few safety rules on board that everyone needs to know. And here we introduce some of the concepts that we learn about in the bay, what an estuary is, um, find out geographically where we are, um, and start to introduce what they'll be doing on board for four hours. 
because they're very, very busy for four hours, as you'll see. Who's this gentleman? This is one of our instructors, Richard, and um, he's, we call him Mr. Energy, as you'll see, he's, he gets the kids really moving. What, what is that? Oh, is that your logo? Yep, that's, well, actually, that's just our name. Our logo is a little different. It's a shark, um, because we see lots of sharks. Now, you mentioned how many of the sharks are dangerous and how many are okay. Would you state that again? Yes, um, out of about 350 species, only about seven have ever been known to, to bite man, and usually by accident. So sharks kind of have a bad rap as... Uh, as man-eating and dangerous, where they're really a, a lot of times do docile. Let's see if I can remember some of the good ones is, are the blue shark, the basking shark, mm -hmm. and the leopard shark are good, and the white shark is bad, the tiger shark. Well, you're saying bad, and I don't want to give that connotation. Um, they can be dangerous, but what's they're definitely what's not that, bad. A seal? That's a marine mammal. It looks like a sea lion. We see quite a few Shh, seals quiet. and sea lions out in the bay. Now what they're doing is putting out an otter troll, and the kids do everything as you can see. They release the net, it's a 20 foot long um, purse na net, and we drag that behind the boat for about 10 minutes, and hopefully catch some fish. It has a float line on the top and a weight line on the bottom, so it's open, and the doors there, which Richard are twisting, keep, keep the mouth of the net open. Mm. And the kids really enjoy this part. This is one of the very active physical things that they do, putting out the net. We catch a variety of different fish too. And what the, what the students are going to look for is adaptations of the fish. Um, what area or habitat the fish live in. And we look at their body shape and their coloration and where their eyes are, that type of thing. Mm. How fast do they pull in this net? Is that the float? That's the, bu the buoy at the end of the net to mark that we have a net out. We go about six knots, so not too fast. And here they are pulling in the net. And here we usually sing sea shanties and get them yelling heave ho a lot. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. And here's the cod end of the net where all the fish would have collected. Um, the this is cod end? It's called the cod end. C-O-D? COD. Yep. And it's a little dangerous right here, so you tell the kids to keep their hands out of the aquarium because there could be a bat ray. Looks like they caught a leopard shark, though. Is that the same leopard shark you got? Is Not the same like one. No, we catch and release all of our animals, so they spend maybe a day or two with us in a tank, and then they're released. And uh, this leopard shark we have with us has a bubble thing in there to keep him alive yeah, and some Yeah, he's got oxygen ice. going. They need lots of oxygen and, and cool water. You can see the bat ray right here. It's a little one, and I think Erwin's showing the kids its barbed spine, which is the dangerous part. It's so poisonous. Yeah. The kids not to touch it. There's a, a tongue fish. A tunnel fish? Tongue fish. Tongue fish. As in what's in your mouth when you stick out? <laughs> oh, a tongue? Yes, it looks like a tongue. It has no tail. Oh, no kidding. Now you can see lots of hands touching the animals here. And um, this is a good opportunity for the kids to really be in contact with the environment. And they seem to learn so much better this way. And here they are using um, a dichotomous key, which helps them to figure out and identify what fish they have. Dichotomous key. Explain that a little closer. Well, it has two questions, two parts for each question. And it directs you by looking at the fish. You look and see how many gills it has or how many, um, where its eyes are. And it directs you through different questions until you end up with the name of the fish. Oh, I see. Hmm. I could have used that in catching those perch. Yeah. Everybody's coming by and saying, what are you catching there? Well, what kind of fish is that? And I said, well, it's a goggle-eyed ocean perch. And they said, oh. Oh, you sounded like you knew what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's what somebody told me. About. Now, right here, um, I think we're just out on the deck, and we're getting ready to pull in the mud grab. Another station on board, there's four stations on board, um, ichthyology being the first one that we saw. This is the benthic station where we get a sample of mud from the bottom. And this Peterson grab will be lowered down by the kids 
and then dropped. So it closes, snaps up a good sample of mud at the bottom. Because um, you might not know this, but the whole bottom of the bay is solid mud. It is. There it is. And then we take that mud, we put it into screens, and um, the screens, the mud is then rinsed through with hoses, and what's left is all the little invertebrates, or little animals without backbones that live in the bottom in the mud. You can mm. see some worms and squirrely things sticking out of there. Pretty alive though, huh? Lots of animals in the bay. It's amazing. That's good. I know that they uh, had a lot of mercury from the gold miners for many years in the bay, didn't they? Yeah, there are high levels of mercury, chromium, silver. Um, that's something that we are looking into right now. Doing some Is it safe to eat these sort of things? Let's say you want to eat some of these uh, shrimp. Well, the, the shrimp is mainly used for bait, and most of the fish that people catch are not eaten. Um, there is a limit of how many fish a year you should eat out in the, the bay, and oh, it's really? not very high. In other words, uh, you wouldn't want to eat 10 striped bass or something like that? No, oh. definitely not. Well, now here's some of the benthic creatures. Um, I think Bundy? these are benthic creatures are bottom-dwelling, mud-dwelling creatures. Oh. And we have clams, shrimp, mussels. That's a shrimp there? That's a shrimp. That's a bait shrimp. That looks like a Texas crawdad to me. <laughs> a little smaller. Yeah. And crayfish. You can see the clam moving around right there. And what's that little dude Well, right it looks doing? like a potato pot bug, but it's actually um, an isopod, which is kind of a marine insect. Oh, really? I bet the fish love to eat these things, don't they? That's one of the main things they eat. Hmm. Looks like it's a pretty good day that day. It looks like a very nice day. Now they're going out on the, out on the bow to get a water sample. And this is one of the stations that we look at water and plankton. It's a good station to illustrate the scientific method. So we have the kids get a sample of top and bottom water. And then using meters, they will look at some different things like salinity or oxygen or temperature. Mm -hmm. And they're taking it down in the cabin to look at that. Mixture of fresh and salt water. Wonder how salty the water is there in relation to the ocean. It's less salty than the ocean, I would assume. But it's not fresh water, is it? No. After the rains, um, before the rains, the salinity was very high up to about 30 or close to ocean salinity, mm -hmm. which is 35 parts per thousand. And after the rains, it's gone back down to about 20, 23 parts per thousand, which is normal. How far up the Sacramento River can you expect salty water to go? Very far up, unfortunately. Um, the diversion of water has caused um, a lot of salt water to move up the river and thus allowing, taking away habitats for the um, delta smelt and the, the salmon and the striped bass. Okay, what are they measuring here? Right here is uh, YSI meter and they're looking at temperature and salinity. So they make some hypotheses about what they think the temperature of salinity might be and here they are actually testing it, finding some results and then they make some conclusions from them, the results they get. What is and that? That is the Hughes Mining Barge. And here we are coming back into the dock and being welcomed by our white um, egret here. He's eager for lunch and awaiting the boat to come in. <laughs> Do you feed him? No, he tries to get food or um, fish out of the aquariums, but we cover them up. But he's always hopeful. <laughs> and that's it. Coming back in the dock after four hours. Four hours. Four fun-filled hours. The kids really, really enjoy it. We have uh, teachers and groups coming back for 10 years or more. So 10 years? 10 they, to 15 years, actually. They keep bringing back different classes, huh? Exactly. What uh, age groups? 
On the Discovery Voyages, we do fifth grade through university level, but we also have shoreside programs which do kindergarten through sixth grade, and those happen at Marine Science Institute, and uh, they happen on shore. We use a beach seine and we use a mud grab. We look at plankton and we do water samples. And mm -hmm. then also we have a, a lab that we're putting together this summer which will have ocean invertebrates. So we'll be able to do class classes with ocean invertebrates. What would you recommend uh, the general public to do in relation to cleaning up the bay and things like that? Um, I would say just get involved as much as possible. If you go to the beach and you see trash lying around, pick it up. That would be a good way to start. Um, start a recycling program. Make sure your s kids in school are recycling and you're doing it at home. Um, and teach your kids about it. Um, that's something we really try and do. And I've heard there are certain rivers like the Hudson River mm -hmm. and uh, other rivers in New York that are so polluted that practically nothing will grow in them. Yeah, well that's going to take a lot of cleanup, a lot Boy. of help from everybody. Might take a long time, but let's hope that with our new technology and things like that we can learn to not pollute so much. Well I think everybody's becoming more environmentally aware, they have to be. Um, our environment is just falling apart otherwise. And I do want to add one thing, we have a marine camp that I'd like to mention for okay. second grade through eighth grade. And if anyone's interested, give us a call. Call off the number again, would you please? It's uh, area code 415-364-2760. Okay, and uh, if people want to contact you, how would they do it through a mailing address? Our mailing address is uh, 500 Discovery Parkway in Redwood City, 94063. And we have lots of different programs for lots of different ages, including teacher seminars. Um, so anyone who wants to learn more about science or how to bring it to your students, give us a call. And how much do you have to pay them for you doing this work? How much do I pay who? <laughs> the company. No, I'm just kidding, because you sound like you really enjoy it. I yourself. love my job. I really okay, do. thank you very much for coming on, Karen. And thank maybe you. we'll see you out there again sometime. I hope so. Okay, we'll see you people later on, and be sure to clean up the bay. So long. Thank you for watching Science Faction. Join us again next week at the same like channel and time. All rights to this program are reserved. Our mailing address is SciFact, care of Rosie Enterprises, Suite 211, 2464 El Camino Real, Santa Clara, California, 95051.